listening to the Post-Apocalyptic Media Podcast, your source for all the latest post-apocalyptic news. Hello and welcome to this week of Post-Apocalyptic Media, the podcast. I am Derek coming at you just as raw as I can be. Uh, straight neck beard and uh, hoodie and glasses because you know what 2021 uh, doesn't deserve my Sunday best just yet so welcome to this podcast Uh, I am joined with co-host Sean hey everyone and Stephanie hello we have an action-packed podcast today we're going to be talking about all of the winners of the best of 2020, the Boomy Awards, we looked across the spectrum at what you can check out for recent post-apocalyptic content, and we picked our favorites. So uh, come at us, bro. If uh, if you have a problem with it, we're here, <laughs> and you know where to find us because we are on Discord. That's right. We at post-apocalyptic media, we are stepping in to the 21st century with um, technology. If you're a Zoomer out there, um, you know, we may be older than you, but we accept you and we we want to communicate on the mediums that you pick because, hey, you're young and you're uh, smart and you know technology. So um, so we're on that Discord. And uh, let me just say that I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Uh, We have, uh, we already have like, 25 people we just announced it a few days ago so uh we have a room for books board games pc games computer games whatever you're into in this genre you're probably going to find it a discussion we have a room just for attack on titan discussion so uh all us all us attack on titan weirdos can just kind of uh (laughs) group together in the corner over there and talk about it can i Uh, lock that door after you guys go in there (laughs) oh no (laughs) This is exactly what we were afraid of when we did this. <laughs> uh, so if you want to be part of that Discord, this is an open invite. Hey, if you're listening to my voice right now, you're welcome. So uh, get on get on our website. Sean has a link. You just click that link and uh, and you're in. So don't forget to introduce yourself. We want to see who you guys are and meet you and understand our audience uh, and uh, and build this community because that's what it's really about. So join us there on Discord. Uh, Check that out on the website. Check out our calendar. We're populating that with announcements. So if you're listening to this, you probably care about what's going on currently in post-apocalyptic world. So check out that calendar. Uh, A few more announcements right at the top of the show. I just, I want to tell you about what TV shows you can check out right now that are airing right now. Now I could go on a list of a hundred TV shows that were great that I would suggest checking out. But these things are happening right now. And so if you like to gather around the water cooler and talk about what's going on right now, what aired last night, these are the shows that are airing. You've got The Stand, hugely popular Stephen King book, has been adapted a couple times before, but this time it has star power and a big budget and it's good. It's yeah. good. It's got uh, one of the big actors from that vampire show, True Blood. It's got um, Whoopi Goldberg in there uh, doing stuff. So uh, I know there's other famous people involved, but uh, that's all that's that's coming to my head at the moment. <laughs> Check out the stand. Uh, that's airing uh, every week, yeah, and we're it's and we're really good. we've got reviews about it. If you want to go and pontificate on on what happened that episode come to our website and we'll uh, we'll chat chat about it we got a comment section too so we're one of the few sites that still has a comment section up so until uh, <laughs> you know the the big tech powers that be say no more comment sections we've got your um megaphone right there so check that out the stand we've got expanse which so is good. super good it's super sci-fi Maybe, maybe it's on the edge of what 
post-apocalyptic uh, really could be about. You know, it's certainly got dystopian elements. Uh, yeah. Human race is not like on the edge of survival at the moment, but it, with aliens involved, you never know. Uh, we got Expanse going on, also Expanse coverage. We've got Attack on Titan. All right, Hello. this is... <laughs> We've gotten a set obsessive Attack on Titan fan uh, in the podcast today in Stephanie. She yes. um, she's writing about it. She she and I are arguing about it every day, and, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> bringing it into therapy sessions. But, uh, but that's healthy. It is the best post-apocalyptic show, dystopian show out there. So you should watch it. And, uh, you know, to, to in, in just a few days, in fact, uh, this comes out on Friday. I think it'll be three days. I think Snowpiercer season two starts Monday. Yes. So be ready for that. That's a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's only I'm had really one good. season so far, but it's good. It's got Jennifer Connelly at the top of the ticket. We got the dude that played Boromir, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so you and uh, uh uh stark what's his name ned ned stark yeah ned stark ned stark is showing up for season two so you don't want to miss that <laughs> who knows it's gonna be what he's so gonna good. do yeah um, we have a snow piercer discord room yeah. and um i wrote an interesting story during season one about the train map for snow piercer so check that out get yourself caught up before season two <laughs> That's right. That's right. You don't need to go back to episode six and freeze your TV and then get out a magnifying <laughs> glass because we did all that for you. Yep. <laughs> and now, you know, uh, the train's all over the place. Now, you know, <laughs> personally, I'd have built like maybe circular tracks that can like move to another track if they're damaged. But I don't know trains. I'm not a train engineer. So don't take my advice, Snowpiercer um, builders. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why I had, had to critique their their train design. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see. Oh, Tribes of Europa? Mm -hmm. Is that what's going on? Yeah, Tribes of Europa, something that was below my radar. Sean brought it to my attention uh, a couple weeks ago uh, with a really epic trailer. Mm -hmm. So um, Tribes of Europa, not out yet. So hold your horses, everybody. But it's going to be out in February. So we're just priming the pump a little bit, getting you guys ready because that's coming out. So that is the TV content. By the way, I'm watching uh, Alice in Borderlands. Not sure. Not sure if it's post-apoc just yet. It's, uh, I'm only a few episodes in and they haven't really revealed that. So if, if it turns out that it is post-apoc, I'm going to tell you as soon as I know. But don't Google it first. Wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving to our topics for today. Uh, Sean, you have a very prescient topic on uh, AI. Yeah, so I found this story about, uh, there's some researchers that believe that AI could basically uh, turn on us at any time, which is scary. You know, they're saying, I guess, you know, Isaac Asimov a long time ago, wrote uh, iRobot, you know, I think it was in the 50s or something like that. And yeah, he developed right. these, what he thought were the three laws of AI, which are basically in a nutshell that uh, robots can't hurt us and they have to obey everything that we say. And also they, but they have to preserve themselves without breaking the first two hmm. rules, something okay. like that. Like, so it, right. that's kind of what it is. But the main point of that is that they're not to hurt us and they're supposed to obey us. Uh, but researchers now are saying we're to the point where AI is is able to learn so quickly that they can surpass their programmers, that they can surpass the people who build them, and that will lead them to not listen to us. You know, that'll lead them to harm us if they want to. And it's it's crazy to think about that because it's like, yeah. you know, at any time, I mean, there are right now. It's not sci science fiction. Right now, there are robots that are self learning, and they're learning every day and they're and they're becoming smarter than humans and and you know if you think about where that could lead yeah. very easily that's really scary so i don't know i don't know what, what are we supposed to do about that 
and plug them. Well, obviously, Boston Dynamics believes we're supposed to make robots even more capable of fighting us and running yeah, right. and hiding. So there that's you right. go. That's right. If if yeah. if you're threatened by a robot, you need to build a better robot to defeat that <laughs> robot. Yeah. Yes. That's Basically. isn't that the isn't that Terminator basically? That's that's exactly <laughs> the plot of Terminator. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, in so many different like shows touch on that. Like I think the 100 touched on the idea also big time about getting around that programming in a way that's terrible for the human race. Yeah. So yeah, it's like most people seem to think that AI will always find a way around it. I don't know. I don't know if that was one of the things that uh, Stephen Hawking used to warn about. I know he also used to warn about like, meeting aliens which as we talked about in a previous podcast has probably already happened we met yeah. aliens already so yeah. yeah let's not let's not go down that rabbit trail just this moment because like i hear that and i'm like oh yeah i want to talk about it and i'm like no no we, we already talked about hour. it yeah. we got, and we already talked about we it. already talked about it can't but... stop talking about it until aliens come visit me <laughs> personally perhaps in a future podcast we'll talk about the idea of these sentient ais um meeting the aliens that would be um you know here we go future topic. oh dear lord that's a disaster um <laughs> yeah that's uh <clears throat> uh i think there was automaton that uh there was a movie i think it had clive owen as the star um and they had an idea where they had an AI that um, they made the AI think it was in a real world when the AI was actually in a simulated environment. Hmm. So if the AI ever like started doing sneaky stuff, it wasn't actually, you know, below their, their knowledge of it. And they just like reset their, the parameters of the uh, environment. And so uh, I kind of like that idea. You build these layers of simulated environments so that if ever they um, go off course, you know, and that's how, that's how I like to do um, with my business where I have people like, you know how Willy Wonka has the guy that like comes and like, oh, I'll give you $20,000 if you, you know, betray Willy Wonka. Mm -hmm. It's just a good little safety valve to have. Just yeah. play both sides. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the village, but with robots. Like the movie, the village. The village. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's the first village reference in the last decade, I think, <laughs> that anybody across America has made. You're so, bravo. You're <laughs> um, I think it was in like the opening scene of the village. They see like an airplane, so it was. It was oh yeah, a hard thing to. Uh... Anyways, uh, I'm not going to criticize yeah. the village right now. Um, oh, we could speak so much about that one. <laughs> I haven't thought about that in a long time. <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, what are we supposed to do about that? We have, we have billionaires who, like Elon Musk, right, was was talking about AI and the dangers it poses. I would think that if he is powerless to stop it, then maybe we are too. What do you think about that? I, I tend to look up to Elon Musk, not only because he's the richest man in the world right now, but also I think he has a lot of, you know, he, he'll say things on Twitter that are like, yes, of course. Like, why didn't I think of that? Mm -hmm. um, which is why he's so rich. Um, but, but I tend to look at what he says about these things. I feel like he has an insider view a little bit more mm -hmm. than the rest of us, you know? And when he says something yeah. about it, it's like, oh, wait, <laughs> we need to listen to this guy. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right, Steph. What what show was it that had the um, the the robot dogs hunting people? Oh, that was an episode of Black Mirror. Yeah, that was yeah. Black Mirror. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that I was like crocodile or something. No, that was a different. All of the the names of their episodes like don't really match, so it's it's hard for me to remember what the name of the episode was. But yes, that was a Black Mirror. Yeah, I, I shy away from suggesting things that are, aren't post-apocalyptic to the post-apocalyptic audience specifically, but I'm, I make an exception for Black Mirror because it is so dystopian. Mm -hmm. And I just think, I think that those of us who are drawn to this genre are drawn to thinking about how things could go wrong. Oh yeah, definitely. 
So mm-hmm. um, if, uh, was it Metalhead? Was that it? Yes. Oh, yeah, In fact, yeah. we, we wrote about it, um, I think, for this website back when it came out. We talked about that episode a little bit on here, I'm on the website. We didn't have a podcast back then. Yeah. So but, if you haven't yeah. seen it and you want to be scared shitless, yeah, then cue up Metalhead. I think it's like season four or five of Black Mirror. And um, check that out because, and the reason it's so scary is it is so real in our world right now. You can see those, you know, the, the dogs that are robots. And by the way, in season one of War of the Worlds, they have a very similar um, they do. robot dog. Yes, it's very, very similar to Metalhead. You're right. And they're aliens. Huh. It's the aliens robots that are attacking people, I think. Yeah. We, and we it don't is, know for sure, but it's almost it seems the same. Like. And so, you know, the, the dog, that robot dog in Black Mirror is actually developed by Boston Dynamics. Oh, so lovely. Th- it's the same yeah. one. Yeah, it's it's called like Big Dog or Big something. I forgot what it's called, but yeah, it's based on that same thing. So it kind of circles back to Boston Dynamics. Nice. Holy cow. Yeah, that's like an advertisement reel for yeah. Boston <laughs> Dynamics to like yeah. governments across the world. Oh my gosh. My gosh. I do not want to f- go down fighting a freaking robot. <laughs> it's People. Terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a little, uh, that's a little unnerving. I'll just say, you know, stock up on anti-robot bullets. EMP grenades. Yes, EMP grenades you know what? should that be what, standard issue. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's really the only thing that will truly stop them. EMP yeah. grenades, little short. So you're not like taking out like the entire grid but it's yeah. just a short range emp grenade that takes out the robot attacking you what a brilliant idea Sean. fallout fallout is preparing us for this so thank oh. you fallout thank you bethesda oh. okay okay <laughs> yeah unless you have a pacemaker yeah uh, <laughs> yeah there's that <laughs> yeah that'd be bad <sighs> so um uh, moving on to our <laughs> awards are we moving to, onto the awards? Is there anything that we need to cover before that? No, I don't think so. All right, let's get into the the boomies. So, um, what I would like is to hear what the nominees are, and then to announce the the winner. So, so Steph, are you on the page? I am. I have the page up. All right, start us off with the first one. All right, the first one is best post-apocalyptic movie of 2020. Right. Our nominees are Songbird, Girl with No Mouth, Greenland, Train to Busan 2, if I pronounce that correctly. Busan. Busan, Train to Busan 2, The Midnight Sky, Love and Monsters. All right. So who won? Train to boost on two. Woo! All right. Congratulations. So Sean, you've seen a lot of these. What what do yeah. you what what makes train to boost on two the best? Um it was I don't know. Like, no, the first one was really, really good. And the second one wasn't as good, mm-hmm. but it was still pretty good. And you know it's funny i look at this list and 2020 you know was pretty crappy when it comes to movies yeah you know and releases and but there's actually a couple really good movies in here train to busan 2 was a a zombie movie you know they're stuck on this train it's a korean movie and they uh it's it's so action-packed like and it and it has a lot of like horror elements to it which i absolutely love horror movies uh so that's that's kind of why it you know wins to me is it's just such an action-packed movie it doesn't have the greatest story like i think love and monsters has a much better story hmm. uh girl with no Ma- mouth actually has a good story too greenland hmm. is incredible uh as far as a uh action movie but it's um it's kind of like it's an apocalyptic movie like you know what i mean it's it's barely post-apocalyptic like the, the end of the mm. world the whole movie is 
building up to the end of the world or when it's, you know, when the meteors are coming down and then it, and then it's post-apocalyptic for like the last, I don't know, little bit of the movie. Um, it's a great movie though. Uh, all of these are great. Midnight Sky. Oh man, these are, I, you know, I just said that they're not that great of movies, but these are really good movies. I think Songbird is the only one that's like, if I were to rank these, I think Songbird would probably be at the bottom of these nominees, mm -hmm. but the rest of them, man, they all have really great elements. That probably all right. help, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that that's good info. You know, if, for people who are listening, who are, and like me, who are deciding which of these to watch because, um, you know, I've got to admit, I didn't watch all of them, um, but I want to, and I, I want to see the best of the best. And so we've got it listed. Yeah. And out of those, I need to know where to start. So, you know, Midnight Sky, definitely high up there, uh, oh, yeah. Love and Monsters, and of course, Train to Busan. Um, Greenland sounds interesting as well. So uh, I just listed all of our nominees, basically. So yeah. there you go. Uh, let's let's move on to the next topic. All right. We've, we've got to move through these fairly quickly. So. All right. The next one is the nominees for best new post-apocalyptic TV show of 2020. These included. All right. Adventure Time: Distant Lands. The Stand, Snowpiercer, The Walking Dead World Beyond, Brave New World, and Raised by Wolves. Good Lord. <laughs> All of those came out this year. Isn't that amazing? We had phenomenal, phenomenal new post-apocalyptic shows in 2020. Um, the winner? The winner is... Yeah, who won? Sn Snowpiercer. Yay. All right. Bravo. Snowpiercer. Congratulations, Piercer. Snowpiercer. Tough, we tough call, though. I mean, man, Raised by Wolves was super good. Yeah. Not every year is like this, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of years where we don't have a new post apoc show that's good. Yeah. Uh, and this year we had so many. We really had a you know, a bit of a internal conflict civil war there at post-apocalyptic media <laughs> yeah. because, um, you know, the picking the winner of this particular category was, was difficult for us. Very difficult. Yeah. Um, man. So who, who won Snowpiercer, right? Snowpiercer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Hard to, hard to argue with that. Yeah, it is. But I will. <laughs> but I will. I mean, you know, there, there's, oh, there's so many good ones and Snowpiercer should be at the top of most people's list. It's going to be, it's certainly more of a cultural phenomenon, right? Like yeah. most of the people that you encounter, if you just listed off those shows, I think they're more likely to have watched Snowpiercer. Just my guess. You're they, probably right. I think. Mm -hmm. I think but, so. um, but yeah, I heavily suggest watching that. Really. I heavily suggest watching all of our nominees in this category um, I'm just going to throw out my pitch for Brave New World because um, I really especially loved it. It's Don't um, watch it with your parents. Absolutely. Absolutely. Watch it with your parents and your pastor. No. <laughs> now great... I need to see it. I haven't seen it yet. Now I want to. <laughs> great discussion starter. Uh, it... Uh, you know, it takes place in a very different world and society than what we see today. And um, it's just a very dystopian post-apocalyptic vision. So, um, and, and it was high quality. What's it on? CBS All Access? Is that what it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So you have to Wait, jump through a few hoops. CBS All Access? It might be Peacock streaming, actually. Oh, it's Peacock. It's Peacock because CBS All Access ah. has a stand. So this one is hmm. what is Peacock. All right. Yeah. And if you're uh, older than 30 years old, you might not even know uh, what we're talking about. But um, <laughs> nowadays, nowadays, instead of paying one bill for cable, you pay a mini, a, a plethora of bills. And yes. one of them goes to Peacock. And a little bit of money goes to CBS All Access, and a little bit goes to Netflix and to Hulu and to Amazon. Actually, Amazon Prime comes with uh, your Amazon Prime membership, and if you're not on that, it's good. Yeah, I can't help you. 
every human just should have prime just automatically <laughs> it does make life a lot easier yes that should be a taxpayer funded initiative yeah. <laughs> uh okay so yeah we we've got uh sean do you want to add anything about the uh about the nominees this year no i i'd agree with it i i like snow I, I again i haven't seen brave new world i haven't seen raised by wolves so so good yeah i mean from the limited ones that I have seen, you know, Snowpiercer, it was really good though. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. And Raised by Wolves, I'll say this, you know, cause not, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you watch it and you realize, you know, this isn't for me, then maybe it's just not for you. I get that. It's got, um, it's got that pacing. That's, that's a little weird, but it's beautiful. It's cinematography wise. They, they are um innovative i guess you could say it's not innovative but it's different um and it's a and it's a good story and it is very much post-apocalyptic uh no question about it raised by wolves they fled earth because earth has become a hellscape and um, mm-hmm. humanity is just trying to hang on to uh the hope of rebuilding somewhere else so uh that that kind of sets up the plot of what's going on and then um uh turns out uh I, and i'm not going to spoil it but um androids were heavily involved in the destruction that was wrought on earth and um guess what they brought with them when they went to colonize a new planet more androids <laughs> brilliant <laughs> uh okay so moving on to the next topic what do we got all right the next topic it- it topic is best ongoing post-apocalyptic TV show of 2020. Ah, here we go. Heavyweights. <laughs> we have The Rain, Fear the Walking Dead, 3%, Attack on Titan, The 100, and The Walking Dead. Ooh, and with a there. dramatic pause. Oh, do you want me to tell the winner or do you want to talk a little bit first? Tell the winner. All right. The winner is Attack on Titan. Yay! Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, you're not biased yes. at all. <laughs> <laughs> Attack on Titan. It is true. Attack on Titan is indeed the best of all of those it is the most layered and most complex and most philosophical series of them all um i i mean i haven't watched three percent or the rain um others on others have on here but um the uh i really liked the 100 but i'm very very frustrated and angry still about certain things that happened in the finale which i can't go into because spoilers maybe i'll make a video sometime but yeah, I'm still mad about that. <laughs> I feel bad for the 100 uh, for Rothenberg, right? Yeah. I feel bad for that dude because um, I know you're mad, but you're not mad for the same reason other people are mad. Yeah, that's true. Everybody's mad. And this isn't like Game of Thrones where they just kind of destroyed everything that they were building. <laughs> in the Game the up last and- season. It wasn't as bad as Game of Thrones, but no, but I would but. say as a longtime watcher, I was unsatisfied with how things turned out. You were unsatisfied. Other people are unsatisfied. There's a lot of unsatisfied people, yeah. but, but what's important for you to know, if you're listening to this, you haven't watched the 100 is that it's still a good journey. It is. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Still worth the watch. The 100 has everything. I mean, it, they, they cover such a wide swath of the concepts of the post-apocalypse, you know, when it comes to nuclear fallout and um, uh, AI of, I, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking more stuff, but I'm not saying it because of spoilers, but let, yeah. let's just say, um, yeah, it gets it gets hardcore. You got gangs and factions warring against one another, cannibalism. the The list goes on. But um, Sean is I'm trying to remember the series that's coming to Netflix that seems exactly like the 100. 
Is that the one coming out soon or is yeah, that a different one? That's Tribes of Europa. Yeah, okay. it's very, very similar. <laughs> Sean wrote a story about this. Tribes of Europa from the preview looks like it might be a 100 ripoff. So kind of. Ripoff is a tough word to say, so I shouldn't use that harsh of language, but oh my gosh. Yeah. A lot of similarities. Yeah. I'm hoping it's um, not too... I mean, the, the trailer had... It even had the girl with the makeup you know, that goes across like, uh, what's her name from 100? Like Lexa? Like yeah, all Lexa. Of the, uh -huh. Yeah, Lexa. You know, yeah, like all of them pretty much. But, uh, and, and everybody, I looked at Twitter and everybody was like, seriously, this is the 100 all over again. Yeah. But I think it was mainly because of that. And, uh, and you know, yeah. I don't know. It, it was kind of spacey a little bit too. You know, that's a, that's a real word, spacey. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if it is the same or not, but it should be fun. Yeah. Yeah, and in that list we had Fear the Walking Dead, mm -hmm. which I think has their best season probably they've ever had. It was good. Uh, the, the Walking, walking Dead. Walking good. Dead's starting to get good again. Hmm. I would say. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm on, I'm <laughs> yeah, on season so, eight. I'm so, waiting oh, the man. desert right now. Yeah. Making your way. <laughs> Getting there. Um. We also had the rain in three percent, which you know heard amazing things about yeah um Obviously, i can't comment as good as attack on titan but you know i can't comment much on those i um uh, you started them didn't you i started three percent and it was good it's one of those things where it's like it's good i i didn't stop it for a good reason i stopped watching because i just am overwhelmed with other stuff to watch at the moment Mm -hmm. um but i fully intend to return to it really hoping for a dub i'm not expecting a dub but sh come on oh. people give me a dub so i don't have to yeah. read the lines uh i just i miss the scenes i miss the facial expressions i miss it all yeah. when i'm reading so um yeah uh that that was it was hard for me to get into attack on titan the first time i watched it because i was reading uh dubs or i was reading um the subtitles. subtitles the whole time mm -hmm. so uh, it wasn't until the dubs came out that i really comprehended what was going on and could appreciate the pacing and, and different things so uh but three percent looks really good from the from the first episode i watched maybe the first two episodes i can't recall really good so uh if you're not if you're not against that or you speak i think spanish is the language just gonna go with spanish uh as, as my guess uh, if you speak that natively, then check out 3%. Let us know. Let's come on Discord and let us know what you think about it. Uh, yeah. Same goes for the rain. Uh, all right, next topic. Next topic. Okay. Let's see. We have best post-apocalyptic book fiction of 2020. And the list includes Lockdown, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the author's names. I'm just saying the titles. <laughs> Lockdown, Seven Days, The Mother Code, Junkyard Cats, Mallory, Seeking Safety. And the winner is The Mother Code. All right. The Mother Code. All right. I don't have any comments on these. Does anybody, did y'all read, read any of these? No, this was all Val here. The, the yeah, book. she's we have an other... avid reader. Yeah, Val's an avid reader, and some of our other writers too. So, really into these. Okay, the next topic is best post-apocalyptic book nonfiction of 2020. We have Mother Nature is not trying to kill you: A Bushcraft Survival Guide. Survival in 2020. Survival Guide for Beginners 2020, The Complete Beginner's Guide for Urban... Oh, whoops, that's... Sorry. Survival in 2020 actually is that book. Survival Guide for Beginners 2020. It has a long title. Hmm. Bunker, Building for the End Times. The Meat Eater Guide to Wilderness Skills and Survival. Notes from an Apocalypse, A Personal Journey to the End of the World and Back. And finally... Survival tips, tricks, and traps. And the Good winner one. is 
The Meat Eater Guide to Wilderness Skills and Survival. Congratulations, Stephen Rinella. That is how your name is pronounced. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for contributing Thank to our collective knowledge of how to make in this world. We, um, you know what? I think that's a good, that's a good opportunity. We're going to pause on the award ceremony for just a moment because um, I have a topic that I think is, is very applicable to this moment in time. And that is about prepping. Uh, you're like, what? What, what do you mean prepping's a topical thing to write now? Well, there are different kinds of prepping, right? There are different kinds of disasters. If you think this world is going down in uh, nuclear bombs, then you're gonna do a certain kind of prepping for that. Uh, this, this, um, this year I turned, I think I turned 36 and um, for my birthday present, Stephanie bought me a Geiger counter. So thank you. As you may not know, that's that's what I'm betting on. If I'm putting my chips on the table and putting it into a corner, the apocalypse that will take out the human race is going to be nukes. Um, that's the most likely to affect me personally. That's just my guess. But um, if you're going to prepare for nuclear fallout, you need to be able to detect radiation, which is entirely invisible, and you cannot see it in any way, shape, or form unless you have the proper equipment. You're going to want shielding against EMPs because when a nuke goes off, if it goes off high enough, it's going to cause an EMP. Uh, they say that three nukes uh, detonated over the United States would basically be an EMP over the entire nation. Terrifying. It takes out all your computer products uh, simultaneously. I mean, just boom, dark ages. I mean, you know, we had a lot of, we had a lot of space between dark ages and the technological <laughs> age, but still dark ages. Um, <laughs> things, things can go really bad really quickly. And so, um, you know, that's one type of apocalypse you might be prepared for. You might be prepared for your water not being good. I mean, if you lived in a place that like Flint, where they had water purity problems, if you prepared already, you had a well, you had your own filtration, you weren't suffering from that because you were a prepper. Um, there are all sorts of ways that being a prepper can be advantageous to you right now in your daily life. Um, I'm always preparing for uh, government dystopia, different types of uh, censorship, and those skills have all of a sudden become uh, very in demand as my um, conservative friends and family have all of, a, all of a sudden discovered that they want to take part in, in that kind of prepping. And I welcome you. Uh, first things first, people get on Signal. Signal is open source. Mm. Open source, that's a, a phrase that you're going to want to learn what it means. Open source basically means they can show you the good, show you the source code of you know what you're putting on your computer or your device. Uh, it's a it's a risk if there's a hacker that looks through that source code and sees an ex something they can exploit. Well, you know it's easier for them to find those exploits. But at the same time, it's also easier for good guys to see you know if there's a back door that uh, is leaking your data somewhere else. Um, open source is to me the way to go if you're concerned about government, because, uh, you know, let me just give you one quick example. There was a company that had encryption software, tiny little company. Well, you know, they get approached by the government. They're not making millions of dollars off their little encryption app, but the government comes by, hey, we'll give you $10 million to put a back door into your encryption app. What are they going to say? Um, some people might say no, but this company said yes. And it was used by a lot of people. And whenever the FBI got encrypted data that was used, encrypted with that up, they just click a button and it's unencrypted. So uh, that's just the kind of thing that can happen when you have closed source software that you're using for critical things. Uh, Signal is not that way. Signal is open source and it is encrypted messaging. So if you are interested in uh, privacy, then Signal is a good step. Uh, EFF.org has some guides to being able to encrypt your uh, computing activities. Um, other ideas, I'm just kind of throwing out some ideas for people because I've been um, inundated with a lot of people who are looking mm -hmm. into stuff 
like this. Um, Pine phone uh, is a cell phone. You know, a lot of people don't know. In fact, I'd say most people don't know that you can turn off your cell phone and it still can power itself in the off state and ping your location places. Um, there are things going on that are just below our level of recognition technologically that could be compromising your security scheme. So uh, PinePhone has a solution. They said, you know what? We can't trust that the software is always going to be telling us the truth. What if we put the GPS module like in a certain part and you can like flip a switch and completely disconnect it from the rest of your device. Oh, interesting. So it doesn't have any power anymore. There are like, uh, if you uh, have a Pine phone, there's like five switches and you can switch on and off Wi-Fi and cellular access and things like that. So check out the Pine phone. It's, uh, it's very young, very new, but it's an open, kind of an open source approach to hardware, which we need. Um, you know, uh, not too long ago, a couple years ago, there was one Acry uh, exploit, which was um, deep in the guts of your computer, below the software uh, layer, which is what we mostly deal with. There was an exploit um, in like the processor itself. I'm not nerdy <laughs> enough to be able to explain it, but um, it's a huge, huge security flaw. Um, and just mm -hmm. as an aside, uh, there is good reason to believe that the government knew about the security flaw for a long time before they let any of us know. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that flaw, as I understand, has been patched. Who knows? But what I would like is for uh, my hardware to be very much um, inspected by privacy experts, people who really care that I have control of that hardware. Pine phone trying to go in that direction. So check that out. If you're concerned about security, those are my top two suggestions. Pine phone and Signal, uh, encrypt your stuff. Uh, I use an app called Cryptomator to encrypt things um, at rest. And you know, it's just, uh, if you have files on your computer, you wanna lock them up, Cryptomator might be a good solution for you. You might have other stuff that you wanna use, but that one's open source. Um, so anyways, that's just some ideas for uh, dealing with, you know, what, what you might um, perceive as being some government uh, overstep and um, protecting yourself and your privacy. Any, any other comments on this topic? No, you've covered a lot. Yeah, I think Fair. you're right. I mean, it's, it's so important to, to prepare. I mean, even to, mm -hmm. it, it's weird how prepping is, has a stigma. And I think no matter what you know, like political affiliation or whatever, you know, people shouldn't be afraid of preparing themselves for anything. Like, like you said, there's so many different mm -hmm. levels of preparing. You don't have to prepare for zombies or nuclear war or, you know, whatever you can prepare for, like you said, the water going out or mm -hmm. you know, here we, pre we prepare for anything. We live out in the country. So we prepare for power outage or, mm. you know, water, going out um, we have a septic tank so we prepare for that you know and, and anything like that you know different levels everyone should at least be doing something i think yeah. smart yeah absolutely you know um if you're alive today your ancestors were preppers yeah. in many yeah. ways True. so um you can you can just bank on that they were ready for disasters because disasters have happened all through history and those who were not preppers and were not prepared uh, oftentimes didn't survive to pass on those genes. So uh, you probably come from a long and proud history of preppers. And I invite you uh, to take part in that as well and join us on that journey because we're all still learning. And I think uh, at least the members of this podcast uh, have uh, power backup. I mean, we, uh, we have solar uh, panels that can attach to batteries that we own. Sean has the same thing. It's not even that expensive. You got a, mm. uh, about 600 bucks, I guess, probably. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Like, even if you can't afford to like go and, you know, buy a generator to keep your entire house going or giant solar panels for your roof, there's still things you can do, you know, on a much smaller scale that will ensure that like your refrigerator 
you can keep your refrigerator a small refrigerator going or mm -hmm. or keep your cell phone powered you know there's there's different ways to be prepared and you don't have to be like super rich to do it and this segment brought to you by the most paranoid people you know <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the awards ceremony, let's get back to the boomies. What's next? All right. We have best post-apocalyptic Kickstarter campaign of 2020. All right, hold on. Sean, would you like to do this one? Go for All it, right. Sean. Yeah, so we have Maximum Apocalypse RPG by Mike Nade, G-N-A-D-E. Uh, the Last Stand Aftermath by Con Artist Games. Haiku the Robot, a uh, cute... Robot Metro or Metroidvania by Mr. Morris Games. Uh, the Few and Cursed Crows of Mana Olana, TPB. I don't know what that means. By <laughs> Felipe Cagno and uh, V2A, The Wasteland Chronicles, number one, Doomsday by Dave West. And oh, and also the winner, I'm spoiling it right now by giving the winner, is yeah. Uprising Curse of the Last em Emperor by Nemesis Games. Uh, and this was, uh, this is something where, you know, we looked at kind of how they did their campaign, um, how, not really how much money they raised, but kind of like above and beyond how much they raised from their goal. You know, that was a big determiner. And then just how great the, the product is, you know, in itself. I mean, I know that one of these things I wrote about with Last Stand Aftermath, I wrote a, a article about it one time, and, and I think uh, that one really caught my attention. Uh, and I know like V2A, the Wasteland Chronicles, V2A guys, they go to Wasteland Weekend and they have, they have a podcast too. And um, so I think, I'm not sure what this, I think this one is a uh, storytelling kind of thing that they're doing. Like they do a lot of that kind of, you know, background story, Wasteland kind of stuff, you know. Like, um, like Dungeons and Dragons kind of a... No, like, I think it's more about like the history or like a... I don't know how to explain it, like a background role-playing thing for Wasteland Weekend, kind of. Oh. I think that's what they're doing there because they okay. do that in their podcast a lot. So kind of almost ARG like. I think so. I'm not positive, but yeah, I guess I guess that would be a good description. Yeah. But um yeah, this I mean, I thought this was a good category because you know, Kickstarters have been around for I don't know, 10 years or so, Kickstarter kind of mm -hmm. Uh, came out and uh, it's it's been great it's it's held the course as far as getting people with these ideas to to get their product out and yeah. in the meantime anyone who backs these products gets some pretty great rewards you know that's i've always i've i've uh, donated to uh many kickstarter campaigns and uh it's it's just like buying it's like an early access pretty much you know but yeah. And it's also, it's great in that it aligns these incentives so well, yeah. you know, if somebody has a great idea and they, there's people wanting them to make that idea, there shouldn't be a barrier that they don't have enough money saved up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, we can pre-purchase it. I, I've always <laughs> thought like if, if Kickstarter was really big back when uh, Terminator got canceled, the TV series, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, like we could have brought it back probably just, pre-selling dvds of season four or something yeah. but um mm -hmm. the last stand aftermath uh that that's a very pretty established company they've been around for a decade making games so they're not a they're not tiny and they're not indie yeah. really but at the same time uh a lot of companies are doing the smart thing with new projects even bigger companies and they're going to kickstarter first and saying is this is this something you want and if you want it you know, put some money behind it and help us make it a real thing. And that can help polish the final product. It helps in yeah. so many different ways. Um, speaking of that one, I am super excited about that game. I kind of want to discuss each of these in turn because, you know, first of all, this is right in the middle of, of what we're about. Yes, we're about celebrating Snowpiercer and Walking Dead and um, The Stand, big stuff like that. We love it. And that is uh, a central point. But at the same time, we also want to help water the seeds of future post-apocalyptic genres and, and series. And th that's what these projects are all about. So um, mm -hmm. 
I'll just yeah. I'll I'll start by talking about that aftermath one. That is a roguelike. If you don't know what a roguelike is, it's a game that's designed for you to lose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you uh you aren't expected to to make it to the end, really. Uh in a roguelike. In a roguelike, it's it's the part of the challenge is how far can I get before I die? And um this one is very innovative. You're like you're leaving a vault and you're trying to find supplies to I think to to give back to your vault people mm -hmm. but like you know when you die you start out as a new guy coming out of the vault and you can even like see the path that the guy before you left and uh there's going to be continuity as far as that goes it uh it just looks really cool and the graphics are astounding they're not like indie graphics either they look better than anything that company's ever done even. And they've had some hits. Yeah. So I'm watching closely. I think that the early access uh, investors are already playing it. Um, I'm waiting until it's, it's released the final version, which to my knowledge has not come out yet. Um, yeah. But that's just kind of my pitch for the last stand aftermath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. What, what else? Um, what else in this in this genre caught your your eye? Um, Maximum Apocalypse is an RPG that I uh, I glanced at it, but I'm a huge huge fan of RPGs. Uh, and then the other ones, let's see, I didn't see the other ones, so I'm not really sure what those are. All right, we'll check that out. We got links all over the website to go to these Kickstarter campaigns to check them out. Uh, and I just encourage you to do so because um, these guys, they're trying to make it and uh, it's easy to get lost in this digital um, deluge of, of uh, things just coming at us. Isn't and, that the truth? Yeah. And we want to support our, our independent creators there. All right. So we've actually uh, covered so many of our awards that we've reached our time. Now we're trying to be respectful of your time and uh, to keep this podcast at a reasonable length. And so here's what we're going to do. We are going to cover five, the remaining five awards next podcast episode. So make sure you tune in. Every Friday we're dropping these and they are currently applicable to your life. So check it out. Next Friday, we're going to be talking about um, the uh, what are what categories we got to look forward to, Steph. We have video game, console, and PC. We have video game mobile. We have uh, craziest post-apocalyptic news. We have best uh, post-apocalyptic scene or sequence. We have an industry achievement award. And then most anticipated for 2021. So that's actually six. All right, everybody. So we we save the best for last. Yeah. In, in most exciting. cases. Um, the the best scene or sequence, uh, I took point on that. And let me tell you, there are some good ones in there. And and we really look forward to introducing you to some of those scenes. Yeah. Um, it's gonna be fun. Thank you all for joining us today. This has been an excellent opportunity to just sit and geek out about post-apocalyptic media. Uh, I want to remind everybody, go to the website, check out the calendar and get on our discord, hang yes. out with us on discord. Join us. Yeah. Everybody stay safe and always be prepared for the big one. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.